Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Maybe you're not truly malicious, but y'all probably need something wholesome. When I was a teenager, I worked at a certain fast food restaurant known for customer service. I used to work the drive through I was a voice in the box, while also preparing drinks for the window. We've had people come through with all kinds of requests and grievances. One day, I was taking a woman's order and she added a bottle of water. The last time I ordered the bottle of water, it was warm. So please make sure you give me one that is cold this time. We keep the bottles in a fridge, but they get stocked from room temp. So I guess she got one that was recently stocked the last time. The lady is really upset about this. And she reminds me a few more times to make sure it's cold. Being a teen, I am mildly amused with myself when I decide to most certainly make sure her water is cold. I grab one of our extra large cups, fill it with ice and stuff the water bottle right in the middle. My co-worker at the window gives me a weird look, but I just tell her to go along with it. The lady comes to the window and my co-worker hands her the cup slash ice slash bottle contraption and I'm feeling slightly smug until the lady starts ranting and raving about how this is customer service and how happy she is to know it will most certainly be cold and so on. She even ended up submitting feedback to the store about how great it was. At the end of the day, I am happy she got her cold water, even if it was in the most ridiculous way. One afternoon, I decided to walk to a strip mall from my apartment. I walked on the sidewalks along a neighborhood road that runs parallel to a very busy road. Often people get frustrated on that main road and will barrel down the neighborhood road. So the town installed several stop signs and speed bumps along the neighborhood road. One block from the strip mall, there is a non-standard intersection. Instead of the usual four-way stop signs, there are stop signs for traffic on a neighborhood road, but there are no stop signs for traffic coming out of an apartment complex. There are big signs saying that the apartment complex traffic has a right of way, necessary because the way the road curves around the building and climbs a hill. Drivers cannot see until they are already into the intersection. Speed limit is 25 miles per hour too. I notice a fancy car coming from behind me and speeding towards that non-standard intersection. Not sure how fast, but definitely more than 25 miles per hour. I am close to this intersection when I hear some screeching tires and horn blowing. Apparently, the fancy car man blew through his stop sign and almost hit a car that was coming into the intersection from that road that doesn't have to stop. Fancy car man starts yelling and cursing at the other driver. Then I see blue lights come on. There was a cop sitting at the opposite stop sign who saw the whole incident unfold in front of him. He tells the fancy car man to shut up and sends the other driver on her way. Then he starts talking to fancy car man, I presume to explain what he did wrong. At this point, I have walked up close enough to hear their discussion. Cop is telling fancy car man that he has to stop at that stop sign. But crossing traffic doesn't have stop signs, as indicated by other warning signs. Fancy car man is irate and says, I don't have accidents. Stop signs are for other people. He included several curse words that I have left out, some directed at the cop. That is enough for the cop, though. He cuffs the fancy car guy and puts him into the back of his police car. A little later, when I'm coming out of a store, I see a tow truck dragging the fancy car away. A smaller story from my time at the front desk. Me, chronically depressed and generally average, and Mr. Kevin, the male equivalent. So basically it's common sense to most, not including the fact we tell people not to park there, that emergency parking is for emergency vehicles. Generally, people understand that if there is an emergency, first responders may need the best access and don't need to try to maneuver around your car or vehicle while working. Now, since it is right in front of our lobby, we give some 
only way to let people get their stuff out and check in before they need to move their car. We don't mind if you take 15 minutes to take care of things regarding getting situated or the like. If you leave it there, we usually call the room and, as I said, most people understand and move the car. No fuss, no muss. Simple concept. The story begins with my entering into my shift and seeing a white car parked in the emergency area. Nothing too out of the ordinary, and I walk to the front desk, and as I take my place, the supervisor who works the previous shift informs me that the guest has parked his car there, checked in, and hasn't moved it in three hours. We have already told him twice to move the car and he has brushed off the requests, and after that we will tell him one last time and give him 30 minutes before we call the city's towing service to come and pick up the car. I sigh and call the room. When he picks up, I inform him that I need to see him at the front desk. Silence. Then a low mumble of him agreeing. I wait for 15 minutes handling a check-in or two before he shows up. Hello, sir. Are you from room X, Mr. Kevin? I greet him. Yeah, what is this about? He said, already irritated. Well, sir, I'm sure you've already been informed that your car is in our emergency parking area and needs to be moved. I informed him, not taking offense as he had probably been lying down before he was disturbed. Why do I need to move my car? He demanded indignantly. Um, it is our emergency parking area, sir. Only emergency vehicles are allowed to park there. I replied willing to explain what I thought was pretty standard for hotels. It's not like there is an emergency going out right now. He countered angrily. That doesn't really matter whether or not there is an emergency or not at the moment. It isn't a parking that is predicated on time or whether or not there is an emergency. That area needs to stay clear in case an emergency happens. He sneered then, crossed his arms. So what are you going to do about it if I don't move my car, huh? I frowned, but he should know the consequences. Well, I wait 30 minutes before I call the city to tow your car. You're not gonna tow my car. He laughed, already walking away. I level a flat look at him walking away. All right, bet. I do wait the customary 30 minutes that I told him I would wait to see if he would heed my advice and he doesn't come back. A small call and interaction with a tow truck driver later in our emergency parking area is clear once again. When he returns, three hours later, he looks around the lot in confusion before realization dawns on his face and he storms back in, scowling and ready to deck me. What did you do? I look him straight in the eye and tell him, I had your car towed. Why? Well, <laughs> because you were parked in the emergency area. So last year the town board put to a vote a proposal to upgrade the town's water mains, sewage and bury the power lines. The town's residents voted to approve this venture and the vote came back with only three of the voters voting no. The town put out notices about three months ago that they will have to shut down my street as the ground will have to be completely ripped up to do this work. The town is very old and the asphalt was laid over an old dirt road that was never done properly. You don't know potholes till you've been stuck in one. They will be doing things the right way as far as I can tell. One of the first streets to be worked on as a plan is to work on multiple areas at once. Their goal is to finish the entire neighborhood in three to five years. You're not government work. So with all that in mind, my neighbor, who is a ripe piece of work and the wealthiest guy in a very rich neighborhood, has opposed this plan from the beginning. He has allegedly filed suit against the town for the inconvenience this will cause him. He also has publicly threatened to sue for the noise this will create is actually the reason this didn't go through five years ago when it was first proposed as he kept interrupting every board meeting. Well, this morning on my way into work, I saw about six cars parked in front of his house. I called my wife at lunchtime to talk about life and parenting stuff and she asked me if I saw the cars that our neighbor parked on our street. I asked if he was having a St. Patrick's Day party and she said no. 
My wife, who needs a hobby other than gossiping, said he found out he plans on leaving them on the street with flat tires and chained together so the road crews can't work. And I responded with, I guess I should call the board then. Volunteer my tow truck and pulled cutters. What does this guy hope to gain here? Edit. I will post the follow-up next week sometime. We shall see what happens on Monday when the construction crews start working. I drove past the 10 cars, all with no license plates, and all tires from what I can see are flat. The construction company is a customer of mine, so this should be good. The owner is the other word for donkey. Love this sub, so thought I'd post a story from about 12 years ago. At university, I designed websites to make some extra cash and pay for tuition, rent, and so on. I got pretty good at it and had a great network of clients around London, UK. One day I was introduced to a lady, we will call her Debbie, who ran an interior design agency in West London. I put the speech marks there because all of her clients were her friends, or friends of her husband. She was extremely wealthy, lived in a house on Warwick Avenue in Magda Vale, and had a chauffeur on call. All of her money derived from her husband, who seemed very sketchy. She also had these two sons who just sat around the house all day smoking weed despite being in their late 20s. Anyway, I designed a website for her which she was very pleased with. Her exact brief was, I want this website to show the best interior design service in London. I quoted the price and she agreed and I built it. But then when it came time to pay, she suddenly started complaining that the website wasn't quite right despite being live and generating lots more traffic than before. She refused to pay and stopped answering my calls. What she didn't realize was that I owned the domain name and could legally do whatever I wanted with it, so I redirected it to her closest competitor, a nearby interior design agency run by a rival of hers she hated. Within six hours, I got a phone call from her going ballistic that her website was broken and that it had to be fixed as soon as possible. I explained that I couldn't really do anything, but vaguely suggested that if she thumbed up some cash, then maybe I could do something. I will not repeat the name she called me, but the next morning my account was credited with the money. I never bothered to change the domain back and plucked her number after that. The site is still live to this day. Generation X are here, and this is a story from my childhood. You know the age of lapsy pills and back. Those little rotating triangle windows all smokers used as ashtrays. An auto AC is a fancy pants luxury. Family was on one of our epic visit the family on the other coast road trips, and I was most likely middle school age at the oldest. Definitely not a tween yet. Dad had a rule of all necessities were done when you stop to fill up the car. The restroom, food and drinks were all performed during the time it took to fill the fuel tank. But no drinks or food in the car. Between my sister and I, the words are we there yet must have been spoken one too many times on this trip in particular. There is also a limited amount of time a child can nap or sit quietly in a car before pent-up energy causes a body to gyrate uncontrollably in time and space. There is also a limited amount of time a child can nap or sit quietly in a car before pent-up energy causes a body to gyrate uncontrollably in time and space. Dad says, the next time someone says, are we there yet, I'll battle you black and blue. Misery like a wet blanket has landed in the back seat. No fussing, no arguing, and no apparent end to looking at passing fences posts out the window. These are the fun times of road tripping, the sun is setting, platters are full, stomachs growling, butts numb, and I'm at my breaking point. I say, so, um, we got a ways to go yet, don't we? Sister snickering cause I'm getting my butt whooped. Then an old sound comes from my mom, a barely contained and muffled sound of giggles. Dad gets ready to stomp on the shoulder to give me my battling and my mom saves me. Mom says, don't you dare. She didn't say the forbidden words. 
You know that mom tone that stops all on their tracks? Yep, that one. That groans and continues on. Mom's giggles continue for a while, then between giggles, the forbidden words fall from my lips. Are we there yet? Followed by full-blown laughing from her, and the pure disgruntlement of my dad is heard in the saddest dad groan that had ever fell on my young ears. I don't remember anything else from this trip, just the satisfaction and mom's unlimited glee. It also was the last family road trip when it was determined I was old enough to fly out east to visit family. Yes, a child could fly unaccompanied by an adult. We got our paperwork hung over our head in a translucent envelope, just a bigger version of our house keys. We boarded, first hang out in the cockpit while everyone else was loading, and received our own plastic wing spins to wear. And the flight crew would always sneak extra drink and snacks to you at the end of the flight if you behaved. The story recited and by some embellished by both parents, grandparents and sister a plethora of times over the years, 40-ish years, to the point of people thinking it's urban legend, told at times to embarrass and others in way of warning. I've always looked upon it as a badge of creativity from my young, timid self. Punch Buggy is a classic road trip game. For those who don't know how the game works, while out on the road with your family slash friends, you look for a Volkswagen Beetles. And when you spot one, you lightly punch the person next to you on their shoulder and call out Punch Buggy or say the color. I played this game with my little sister all the time when our mom took us places. The only rule at the time was no punching the driver, which is reasonable. Then my sister started whining and complaining about me punching too hard, or just me punching her in general. I'd never severely harm her on purpose. I would stop before I accidentally left marks on her. It got to the point where one day my mom got sick of her whining, so she said that's it. No more playing punch buggy in a car. I shrugged, thinking that was no big deal. Then, an idea came to me. No punch buggy in a car? Okay, mom. Cue Grinch's smile. On the way to the store that day, I spotted several beetles. Seven to ten, I think. But mom said no punch buggy in a car. So, when we parked and got out of the car, as soon as my sister shut her door, I delivered several punches to her shoulder. When I was done, I turned to my mom and she was glaring at me. I thought I said no more punch buggy. I smiled and shrugged. Well, you said no punch buggy in the car. We're out of the car. In the end, I got my switch taken away for the night, but it was worth it in my opinion. I may just start punching myself. Edit. This might clear some things up since I'm getting slugged in the comments. My sister punched me as well whenever she saw a beetle. She just complained whenever I punched her. Also, I would never intentionally leave marks on her. Also, I changed the wording so it doesn't make it look like I abuse her. I love my sister to death. Really. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.